Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. Today on February 12th, 2024, um, I'm excited to be talking about something that we haven't talked about too much on the podcast, which is um, important female thinkers and specifically um, female economists and the relationship between women and economics. Uh, we're going to be talking about Harriet Taylor Mill a bit too. So there, there's a lot of good stuff in store for us. Um, I'm excited to welcome Gian Domenica Becchio to the podcast. She is a professor of economics and the history of economic thought at the University of Torino or Turin University, as we say it in English, I guess. Um, I don't know. The Internet says multiple things. Um, she's also the author of several books, including A History of Feminist and Gender Economics. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Well, I think that concerning what I have I've been studying all my life, I think that sometimes um, rights uh, are taken for granted. And I'm talking about the women's rights and women, the position of women, uh, particularly in the public sphere. So the place of women in the workplace, the place of women in politics uh, and in the economy. So we, uh, so I, I really think that sometimes young people young generation now, they tend to take for granted that we are all equals and we have the same rights and that that's nothing uh, concerned today about discrimination or gender biases uh, or prejudice and so forth, which is not completely true, true. In, if, especially if we think about um, some countries, some geographical areas and so forth. So... And something else that uh, maybe younger generation generation does not know is that this equality, this gender equality, uh, has been the result of a very, very long history of, uh, of fighting against uh, gender prejudice and gender biases. And that's why I've been studying and research the way in which gender equality has been reached within the history of economic ideas and the history of economic thought. And uh, I've also been researching um, if there, there were some moments in the history of this discipline where this gender inequality was somehow justified from a theoretical uh, point of view. And so that uh, was what is important for a younger generation to understand. The gender inequality is still an issue. And um, there is a long story uh, that has brought women to be equal, as equal as men in the in the society. Yeah. And it's funny that you say, say this because I was preparing for this interview and I was thinking to myself, like, I'm waiting to be convinced almost because I, I do take it for granted in a way. I'm like, well, I do my bit. I'm just a woman and I study econ. Isn't that enough? Um, and, and I think maybe part of part of like what what maybe our responsibility is or what we can do is just learn about it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So just being a woman is fine, right? But actually committing to like learning about, well, we knew it wasn't quite equal. So like, how is it that now I have the opportunity to do this as well? Um, I guess I kind of have some responsibilities to do that. And I guess that's why we're here. But apart from that, uh, our econ club is doing a women in economics thing. And I was like, do I even have to go to that? Like, mm -hmm. I... I don't know. Um, and so I guess this is like the time, this is a good time for me to hear this and talk about this. And, and I'm sure that, although I think there are a lot of people my age who kind of, they are excited to, to be in a club with women in economics. Um, 
I don't know if we quite understand why that's so significant and why we have to make that distinction. And so I'm kind of curious, um, and we'll get into it as we, as we keep going, but for, for I guess, a, a first question, what is feminist econ and why is it important to make this distinction? Sure. So feminist, um, feminist economics uh, is um, a, re- a specific research field within the economic theory, which is uh, regarded as an heterodox um, economic approach, which means that feminist economics criticize somehow mainstream economics, which is also called neoclassical economics. The history of feminist economics started roughly 50 years ago. But before going into the history of feminist economics, the aim of feminist economics is to uh, highlight that in the in the market in the economy and in uh, in the social institutions such as the family there was a division of labor which was inefficient and unfair because it was an, a, a division of labor basically based on women as care providers, caregivers, and men as breadwinners. This means that women were basically relegated within the domestic sphere, providing care for the family, but care is an unpaid work. And when a few decades ago, women started to enter the job market, their uh, situation somehow got worse in in this sense. Women, since then, were forced to carry the so-called double burden. So they performed in the the marketplace, so they they get a, a job, and then they uh, succeeded in in not just in getting a job, but also in in a growing up as a workers. So in making a career in any field, in any possible field. Nonetheless, the burden of caring the of the for the family is was and still is almost totally on women. So feminist economics, sorry, while mainstream or this division of labor as an efficient division of labor by using the theory of comparative advantages, the, the, approach, the feminist approach to these gender issues within economics criticize the the neoclassical or or mainstream perspective by pointing out that the division of labor within the household, as well as the division of social roles in the public sphere, is not efficient because uh, it implies a a kind of segregation of women into a specific role, the role of care provider. Yeah. Besides the fact that it's not efficient, it's also unfair. And why mm-hmm. it's unfair? Not because it's a matter of taste. Because for, for mainstream eco- eco- uh, economics, women are care providers and men are breadwinners b- because, uh, because they like to, to, to be like that. It's just a matter of preferences. It's just a matter of tastes, personal preferences. Feminist econ- economics underlined that very often these kind of social roles are not just a matter of preference, but they are very often they are the result of gender biases, gender prejudice, social pressure, and so forth, especially in some period of, of, of the history of humanity and in some geographical area. So um, this is the main, uh, um, let's say, difference between feminist economics and mainstream economics. 
And, and so it's a combination of a feminist feminism and economic theory. So using economic theory in order to explain uh, feminist stances, which the, the, the most important one is, of course, the gender equality. Not just in the marketplace, but also in the, within the household. Yeah, I guess like I, I learned about this a while ago. I, I took a class on, um, on, on the USSR. And, and they talked about the double burden a lot, where mm-hmm. under Stalin, there was this idea of, well, women have to work as equally as men. But the, the burden of, because the Politburo was all men, and they, they especially like, I mean, the they didn't understand, but also GDP measurements don't even take this into account. So the way Absolutely. economics is structured leads you to not be able to see um, or measure or compare um, certain things, I guess because in part it was created solely by men or with a certain thing in mind, right? Like money, if you're using money as a form of measurement, then it's hard to measure monetary value of something that doesn't have one, you know? Precisely, yes. Well, the, the, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. go ahead. Yes, the idea that um, there there is something that you can't measure in a traditional way by using money, for example, which is uh, everything that is connected with uh, the emotional sphere, let's say so. And this, traditionally, there is this idea that oh, whether everything that is connected with emotions, with passion, with love, with compassion, with taking care of anything, uh, is a, belongs to the feminine sphere. While everything that is connected with uh, competition, uh, bravery, uh, uh, hard work, uh, self-made uh, men. <laughs> so this is a very dichotomical uh, way of thinking about society. And um, you mentioned the the Soviet uh, system. In the, it's true that in the Soviet system, uh, women were somehow pushed to work. But it's also true that if we uh, consider data of, of the time, uh, Soviet Union was one of the of the most uh, of the worst country in terms of gender inequality uh, for two for basically for two reasons. The first one is that uh, men never uh, never take took responsibilities for uh, the the household. On, on one side, and then on the other side, women were forced to uh, work in some specific uh, job sectors, uh, which were less paid, and uh, they barely uh, were able to make a career. So, and these are two phenomena which are also common uh, almost everywhere, even today. Uh, but in the Soviet Union, it, that was very, very uh, impressive. The first phenomenon is called the pink ghetto. So women are usually usually pushed to work in uh, uh, job sectors uh, which are um, less paid. And they are uh, health sector. So they, they work like as nurses uh, in, in, the, in the hospitals, uh, in the in the in fast day, uh, the gardens to sectors are the less paid. Uh, this is the first phenomenon. The sec- second phenomenon uh, is is called gla- glass ceiling, which means that women um, face a lot of hard, uh, a lot of difficulties to uh, make a career, uh, to break this glass ceiling, and. This might be um, a, an effect of discrimination or self-constraint. Self-constraint, which is uh, basically uh, the effect of the fact that women, again, are taking care of, the, of their families, of their household. And so they are very often uh, ready. Uh, they tend to uh, work part-time. They tend not to go 
abroad for missions or whatever, they tend to not to perform extra hours because they have something something else to do um, in their household. And and this this set of uh, conditions makes very hard for women to build up a career. In fact, if we if we look at data, um, today's data, there's no sector in the world, in a, in no country where we can say there is gender equality. Still today, everywhere. Also, well, what um, do we mean when we talk about gender equality? Because I, I would take like obviously, I, I see how something like nursing might be dominated by women and that might be more of like a stereotypical bias sort of situation um, where institutions push men and women in different directions. But what if naturally more women are inclined to do that? Like, how do we know what equality looks like? Does it mean that the same percentages are in them? Yeah. How do you measure that? How do you look at that? Oh, gender, in, gender equality or gender inequality, uh, it, it's measured. It's measured in uh, every sectors. Uh, in every in every sectors, uh, and there are some there are many da- data sets: World Economic Forum, ILO, uh, the UN, uh, European Commission, uh, and single states, uh, Institute of Statistics, and so forth. So, gender equality is measured, and uh, is for example in the economy we have three uh, big set big form of measurement for gender equality, gender labor gap, gender wage gap, and gender entrepreneurship gap. Gender labor gap is the measurement of how many women work in a, in, in a country uh, versus how many men work in that same, same country. Uh, gender wage gap is the different wages, uh, different wage uh, gained by a man and a woman who are performing the same uh, job uh, at the same level. And uh, uh, gender entrepreneurship gap is the, the difference between the number of uh, female entrepreneurship and, and the number of men entrepreneurship. So uh, we have data, huge da- data sets, and uh, uh, we count basically uh, the difference, the gender differences, and as I mentioned uh, before, uh, still today, there's no gender uh, equality in uh, any single uh, sector, uh, o- almost everywhere in, in, in the world. Uh, so there is a classification of uh, countries where gender equality is higher and uh, uh, from, the, from the top down to the bottom. Uh, Scandinavian countries usually uh, are in the top positions, uh, while uh, this year's re- this year re- report mm. uh, in this year report, if I'm not wrong, it's Afghanistan, the the, the country where the gender inequality is, has reached uh, the maximum grade, the maximum uh, value. Let's say so. Um, besides the economy, uh, we have we measure gender equality also in politics uh, by measuring the different number of men and women in the parliament as head as, as premier as uh, head of states and so forth. We also measure gender inequality uh, in education, which is the the different the difference between young boy, young men uh, who get a, a university degree versus young ladies who get <clears throat> a university degree. On this specific point, I can tell you that there is gender equality, which means that uh, there's basically there's, uh, the, the gap is uh, it's almost a zero in, in gender educational gap. If when we measure gender education gap, the gap is almost zero. And this makes things even sadder because since a century ago, women were not allowed to enter academia. So they 
they did, they were not allowed to get a PhD or a university degree. So the, the, the gender inequality in the economy was a somehow justified by the fact that they were less educated than men. But today is not the, the situation is, is different. Men, women are as educated as men, but still there is a huge gender uh, gap in the economy and even bigger in the, in the political arena. Think about how many women you know uh, who are uh, leaders in their country or head of states uh, versus the number of men. So this this there is this is the, the 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 most important thing. Every time we talk about gender equality, we have to take a, we have to be very careful and very focused on data. Data are very important. Uh, otherwise, it's just uh, you know, uh, it might be something related with ideology or uh, political political stances. Not we are talking we are talking about numbers. We are talking about measurement. That's why economics, it's important. Uh, because in economic theory, we, we are used to combine theory and empirical studies. Uh, and we started with data, we started with number in order to, you know, first of all, show the problem. And, and second, try to explain the reasons behind this inequality. So I, I kind of want to back up to how this this field within economics even emerged um was there a woman economist or just a was there an economist generally maybe who was interested in this that kind of started looking at this measuring this how did this issue come about as a question for economics to deal with and who dealt with it and i guess then we kind of know how it's being dealt with today but we can kind of move on into I don't know, solutions and culture and kind of like... Name. Uh, but we, we have many founders of feminist uh, economics, but we have a very important name for... Uh, in the history of gender issues within economics, on the other side, though, on the mainstream uh, side of the, of the story. Uh, Gary Becker... Um, one of the most important uh, Chicago economists in the 60s and in the, in, in the 70s, he started to, to write about gender issues, but successfully to um, explain the division of the traditional division of labor between men and women within the family and outside in the market as efficient. As I mentioned before, Many economists, especially women economists of the time, started to react against this uh, explanation. And they found it, uh, and they started to write against this justification of the traditional division of labor between genders, basically. Uh, and they, and in the 90s, Gary Becker got the Nobel Prize for economics. And uh, so, the is economics of the family is uh, is gender uh, economics became very popular so feminist economists decided to found uh, a, an association uh, to found a new research field the feminist economics so uh, the international association of feminist economics was founded in 1992 one year after the gary becker won the nobel prize so this is a, a very recent story Although there are so many women economists in the past um, who were uh, uh, focused in, in, in underlying the general, uh, the, the so-called subjection of women. If we think about the subjection of women, of course, we think about the John Stuart Mill booklet, which was published in uh, 1869. But John Stuart Mill who was a man, of course, <laughs> he was, uh, he belonged to this story. Uh, but the story of the, um, the call for gender equality uh, is full of women scholars, uh, 
and also women economists. Although the label women economists might may be used only for uh, economists of the past century, the last century. Uh, but many, many women uh, were uh, engaged in this fight against the, su the so-called subjection of women. Feminism itself is a cultural movement that started at least two uh, centuries ago, uh, in, in the 19th century, uh, within the tradition of classical liberalism, in order to promote gender equality. Now, feminism is a, is a multifaceted uh, cultural and political movement with many political differences within feminism. But the, the very beginning of feminism is within the classical liberal tradition, and which started, uh, as I mentioned before, in, in during the modern age, um, with so many women, uh, women scholars. Uh, among them also Harriet Taylor Mill, who was uh, John Stuart Mill's uh, wife. Uh, but there are so many more. And th this is a, a thing that I really want to underline again. Feminism is the call for gender equality. It has nothing to do, at least at the very beginning of the story, with the superiority of women, of the feminine sphere. It's the call for gender in for gender equality in the name of individual freedom. All people, all individuals are equals. They are all free, regardless of gender. And of course, also regardless of ethnicity, income, and, and so forth. But let's stay focused on gender issues now. So... This is very important. This is the very beginning of the feminist movement. And this started in the 19th century within the classical liberal tradition. So, I'm trying to think. Like, nowadays, we look at... Um, we look at the displacement of men. There's been a lot of work on how men have been displaced in the workforce. And obviously the other side of that is that women have been entering the workforce, which is obviously not in itself a bad thing. Um, but I guess when you take it alongside the fact that women are still doing, they have the double burden, right? They're doing the majority of household work. What needs to happen for the, the division of labor to become more aligned with preferences and equality of opportunity between genders for both to each. And I guess when will we know when we've reached that point? How do we know what that looks like? If you, especially if you can't measure household work the way that we measure economic activity usually. Yes. Well, actually we can somehow measure also household activities. Uh, we can use time, for example, how many hours uh, uh, Man, a uh, husband or uh, and father, uh, used to spend uses to spend uh, taking care of children. Uh, how many days of, in, in a month? So we can we can measure uh, not with money, but we can measure uh, by using time. First, this is you know, just to to re reply to, to the to the issue of measuring uh, household responsibilities. How we can reach, um, how we can call, relocate, let's say so, men's time within the household. Well, I, I think that there are two ways. One way is, um, is connected to an economic policy agenda, uh, which should be uh, designed uh, in order to to make clear that <clears throat> we have parents and no longer mothers and fathers. So, for example, uh, instead of talking about maternity leave or, or and paternity leave, we have to think about uh, parental leave 
and possibly to uh, nudge couples to uh, split equally the leave. Uh, and some other economic policies, which should be aimed to just to, to nudge uh, a, a possibly more equal division of labor between uh, parents. Uh, the other the other way is a, a long run project. It's it's all about education. We need to uh, change our way of thinking about the role of men and women within the society. Uh, we need to overcome gender stereotypes. Uh, we need to accept uh, that not that women are, and men are free to choose a different uh, way of living, and we have to uh, to get rid of uh, any gender uh, prejudice. Uh, but this is a very long-run project. It's an educational project which involves uh, families, the educational system, and so forth. Um, so that that's that's what I, what I I think. Yeah. What what have been some of historically, and I guess now, what have been some of the biggest obstacles, and then I guess solutions or like feats of feminist economics? What has it accomplished? Okay. Um, well, it, uh, obstacles were almost everywhere uh, in the history of the subjection of women. And there were legal barriers uh, for women to be responsible for their own uh, money and properties, for example. There were uh, barriers for their education. Women were prevented uh, since a few decades ago, since the First World War, uh, so to to get a, 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 an academic degree, for example. Women were also, uh, well, divorce and abortion were not allowed since a few decades ago. And of course, divorce uh, and abortion are laws, rules, that uh, allow women to to be uh, responsible for their own choice, for their own uh, uh, life and and, and body. Uh, women uh, were and these these were let's say uh, form of specific legal form of um, discrimination or which may made the life of men and the life of women different. And then there, there, there were, and still there are, some uh, traditional uh, way of thinking uh, which consider men and women different. Not from a bi biological point of view, which is, of course, uh, nobody is, uh, is going to uh, deny it, but um, the idea that a woman may, uh, as uh, a man, uh, and vice versa, is still is still a, a, in some context may 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 be still a, a stereotype. So mm -hmm. a woman might be an astronaut. A woman might be may be a, a may perform a typical masculine uh, job. A woman may be the president of the United States, um, but how about a man who wanted not to work outside the household, who want to perform the traditional uh, figure of care providers? Uh, I, I I think that there is a, there's still today kind of stigma against, against uh, this um, this uh, choice made by a, a man. Uh, so the. No, Feminist economists uh, in in the past three or four decades were able to to make clear that gender inequality still persists, and we need some form of uh, you know uh, some way of reducing 
this gender uh, equality. Of course, there is no consensus, general consensus on the possible tools, the possible instruments uh, for making a gender equality agenda. But for example, uh, we, uh, the international organization, we, uh, we, gender equality is one of the aim uh, to, uh, to reach uh, sooner than later. And, and I think that this uh, political uh, agenda is important because when I was younger, much younger, when I was a, a, a teenager or a young student at, at college, I, I've been also always a classical liberal. So I was against this kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, discourse. I was even against feminism, not against, but not very sympathetic. Because I, I, I was totally, uh, I, be, I totally believe that uh, gender has no importance. We are all individuals, and if we are free and if we live in a free society, everybody is gonna flourish. Uh, if you can uh, fulfill your dream, you will be free to reach whatever you like, regardless of gender. So there's no need to, to push for a feminist agenda and so forth. But um, now that I, I grew up and I became old, much older, uh, I must say that, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is not enough. I mean, we all agree on the fact that individuals are all equals. And if they are lucky enough to have been born and live in a free country, they can flourish and they can fulfill their uh, dreams, their attitude by following their attitude and so forth. But it's also true that discrimination persists and that there are so many stereotypes. There is social pressure and these Factors, cultural factors are very important. So it's very important to make it clear that we need some feminist agenda. Again, feminist, feminist for me has nothing to do with an undervaluation of the male sphere or a hypervaluation of uh, the feminine sphere. Nobody is superior to another. Men are not superior to, to women and vice versa. Unfortunately, there are some sectors, not to mention some countries, where this is still a, a very, this inequality, this gender inequality is still very strong and harms women. And if a person is harmed, is harmed, uh, the society as a whole is in danger. Are there differences between you and some other feminist economists? Oh. So <laughs> you outlined what you believe to be feminism and what you mean when you talk about that, but are there others who disagree and mean something that goes further or is less? Um, and how does that kind of play out in the development of the field? Yes. Um there, there is a, there are some disagreement among feminist scholars, let's say so, and feminist economists uh, specifically, especially because since uh, the second wave of feminism, which began after the sexual revolution in late sixties, feminism feminism has been connected very strictly with the Marxism. So the majority of feminist scholars. Uh, are um, Marxist or were Marxist and are very progressive today. And they are very suspicious against the uh, classical liberal tradition. So there are a very few uh, classical liberal feminists today. It's a kind of, it's completely different from the history of feminism of the beginning in 19th century. As I mentioned before, feminist, the first early feminism was totally belonged to feminist 
uh, to sorry to classical liberal tradition. In the in the second half of the last century, the, the majority of feminist scholars were Marxist because they and they connected capitalism. They blamed capitalism for patriarchy. Let's say so. So they consider patriarchy and capitalism as the two the two faces of the same coin. And um, and this was a kind of and in economics, this means that they uh, promoted a, 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 a an heterodox perspective, uh, which was totally against uh, they. Uh, they supported the uh, Marxian econom economics, uh, post Keynesian economics. Uh, so they were different. Uh, so today there are a very, very few feminist uh, economists who belong to the classical liberal tradition. Uh, but there are. And so uh, it's it's important that the the, the the feminist stance for gender in a, for gender equality uh, does not belong only to the the left. Uh, traditionally, historically, it's rooted in the classical liberal tradition, and today we have classical liberal feminist scholars and economists, not just the economists. Um, so it's it's important to to make this distinction. Because sometimes mm -hmm. uh, feminism is, is connected with with the left, only the left, which is not is not true. And the the, the main mistake of uh, Marxian feminist uh, feminism and Marxian feminist econo economics is that patriarchy belonged uh, to non capitalistic system as well. So we it's, it's true that we have a patriarchy in uh, we have. We add patriarchy in, in in a capitalistic society. Patriarchy means the subjection of women and the fact that men are more powerful than than women. Uh, but it's also true that patriarchy is everywhere, has been, and is everywhere, even in non capitalistic society. Patriarchy was a, was a very old phenomenon, much older than capitalism. Uh, and the other mis mistake made by uh, Marxism uh, and feminist Marxists is that that kind of mm, feminist, uh, Marxian feminist uh, scholars and economists, they were they were they thought that right. once the capitalism w will collapse, also pa patriarchy will collapse. Uh, so they. They never put a, a specific attention on gender issues. They were all about class and class struggle. And if I may add something, there is also mm -hmm. on the opposite side of the political spectrum, there is also libertarianism and anarchism. Uh, many libertarians in the past belonged to the feminist tradition. Somehow they made the same um, assumption of, uh, of Marxist, but in the opposite side of the spectrum. So they consider patriarchy and the state as, do, as the two faces of the same coin. And they wanted to destroy patriarchy by destroying the state. So by destroying the political uh, arena, the traditional political arena. Uh, and again, uh, patriarchy or the subjection of women belonged to it to several traditions, not just to the it's not just connected with the, the notion of state. Uh, the classical liberal tradition is the it is in the middle of these two extremes. And uh, classical liberals they they don't want to destroy society. They don't want to destroy um, uh, the, 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 insti the classical institutions. Uh, they wanted to uh, pursue equality, in this case, gender equality. I, I still kind of struggle a little bit to wrap my head around kind of this balancing of 
feminist economics as a criticism of neoclassical economics and that mm-hmm. the assumption that preferences are are essentially explanatory of everything. But at the same time, I, I know a lot of folks who, um, men who, who want to be stay-at-home dads, which I, I think is great. They, they're like, keep it a secret. And I'm like, no, but it's fine. Um, mm-hmm. But also women who want to. But a lot of the, the girls I know, I, I know we're like 10 years early, I think. Uh, maybe not. But now. But a lot of them are worried that if they choose to be a full-time stay-at-home mom like they really want, that they're not going to be setting the right example for their daughter or son or neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, And that their role in the community has to be to uphold this idea that you can be a mother and that you can also work. Because otherwise, the narrative is going to stay that women belong in the home. And I understand this this kind of worry, but isn't that like kind of a hard line to toe too far. Because if a woman wanted to hypothetically stay home or not at all, isn't it, isn't it hard to not become destructive if you want her to set an example or if she feels as though in order to go against the narrative, she has to do something that is not aligned with her preferences? Like, I, I think what maybe what I'm struggling with is kind of the balance between, well, preferences explain some of it, but obviously not all of it. So what is the balance between what the, the where does the feminist and actual equality of opportunity? Yes. Um, <clears throat> no, first of all, feminist economics does not deny preferences uh, and tastes and personal tastes. Feminist economic on the opposite side, Neoclassical econ- economics, especially in the 70s and 80s, when Becker uh, wrote his issues, uh, his um, books and articles on uh, gender issues, uh, neoclassical economists, they consider tastes and preferences as the only possible way to explain division mm-hmm. of labor. Mm-hmm. So this is the first point. Uh, so it's important to uh, to underline that sometimes we are we think to be free, but we are actually influenced by uh, social pressure and gender stereotypes, or there is actually discrimination. So you mentioned the uh, the example of a, a woman who really want, wants to stay at home and not to perform any job outside. And being a full full time mother uh, and, and, and wife, and uh, and this might uh, might uh, prevent her daughters to to feel to to to, to become to, to assume a, a role in the public sphere. Well, I think that um, we every 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 person uh, every parent. should um, promote the happiness of their uh, of children, daughter and daughters and sons. So there's nothing wrong in, in preferring to be a full-time mother or a full-time father. There's nothing wrong in not, in, in, in not wanting to be a mother at all. Nothing wrong. The only thing that is wrong is to not to follow our own uh, desire and um, dreams. So there's no there's no cultural agenda to follow. We don't have to reduce our personal freedom in order to fight for the right fight. The right fight Mm -hmm. is to be free, Uh, but we have to be actually free. So how how much is the degree of freedom in a society where there is gender discrimination? Um, It's a real, it's really a a free society. And if the the society is not entirely free, it's not possible that 
we uh, individuals are free because the society is the sum of individuals. Uh, so again, <clears throat> the the main the, the main difference between feminist economics and neoclassical economics, especially in the 70s and the 80s, is that personal preferences stay there. They are not denied. But it's it was about time to consider that they were not the only uh, motivations for individuals because we are embedded in a society with values, cultural norms, uh, stereotypes, biases, and so forth. It's very yeah. hard to measure. It's it's the, the 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 problem is that if you can measure preferences by using you know utility functions, it's very hard to measure this kind of, of, of extra economic factors. That's why the, the, the neoclassical economic theory is more is much more powerful because it's able to formalize the utility function, formalize preferences. While it's almost impossible to formalize, to measure and to formalize gender stereotypes, for example. And we, we can collect we can collect data, but it's very hard. To, we can't build up a, 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 utility, a, a gender stereotype function, let's say so, uh, in order to you know show, okay, this is a gender stereotype, and this gender stereotypes just a gender stereotype makes uh, uh, this point uh, less efficient uh, and, and so forth. So that's the problem. The, the femi feminist economics, especially at the beginning, was less formalized and less powerful from a methodological and theoretical point of view, but was much more powerful from a cultural point of view. So I guess uh, another question is when, when you work with data, do you make exceptions in terms of, um, I guess may maybe you'd call it realization of preferences, work preferences, stay at home preferences, whatever. Um, equality, I guess. Do you, do you make, do you control for like religion or other societal, I don't want to call it pressure, but cultural, um, explainers that I think enforce certain gender roles? Because I, I don't know if, if that sort of thing shapes your preferences and shapes the way that you live. Um, and choose, I would think that it becomes hard to say that you're unequal if your religion or so, something similar, I think that's just maybe the clearest example, um, kind of tell, I don't want to say tells you, but like, is how you are informed about your preferences. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So data, the da data set try to be as much as Pos uh, neutral as much as possible. Um, so usually we measure the number of women performing, the number of women in the job market, the number of women in that specific sector, the number of married women who work in a specific sector, the number of married women with, who uh, quit the job after having the first child. The number of women who uh, are fired after uh, the first child. The number of women who never search for a job unless they are uh, unmarried. So these are how do we build how we build up a data set. We try to be neutral. Once you collect the data. Of course, you you, uh, you 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 collect the data in a specific uh, country or in a specific group, in a specific community, and then you compare. So uh, when you compare data, you see differences between different countries, between different groups, between different uh, ethnic groups in the same country especially in multi-ethnic society like, like the, the U.S. And once you have these, uh, subs, uh, this data, uh, 
you can compare and you can uh, choose to uh, be focused on a specific extra economic factor or cultural factor, such as religion, for example. Um, or uh, uh, the geographical differences between north and south in a specific country, like Italy, for example, or this, the differences between women, Asian women within the U.S. versus, I don't know, Japanese women, uh, and so forth. So somehow you can you can make you you make an hypothesis and then you. Uh, try to verify or falsify that hypothesis. For example, religion is very important in certain groups, in certain ethnical group, uh, groups, and um, how these religion values, religious values affect the, the decision of, of women to quit their job uh, once they get the, the first their first child and so forth you can do you can you can make so many hypotheses and and then you have to verify and falsify by collecting new data so there are kind of ways to account for large scale preferences so i i feel like this makes me a bit more comfortable um yeah because i i just I'm always like, I don't even know my own preferences. How does someone else know my preferences? How could you model that? I don't think you could. How do we know when everyone is realizing their preferences? Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, do you have a favorite feminist economist? I do. I do. Uh, I uh, My favorite, uh, her name, <laughs> one of the, probably the only one feminist economist uh, who belonged to the classical liberal tradition, although she was very, she was somehow progressive. She has a progressive agenda, but she was totally against the idea that uh, she was anti-Marxist uh, and she was uh, totally against the idea that uh, the feminine, the, there was a superiority of the feminine uh, versus the masculine. Uh, she was completely for uh, a supporter uh, of the equality of individuals regardless of gender. But she pointed out the fact that uh, women basically were, have been uh, constrained in this ideal of the perfect housewife that was very popular in the, in the 50s and in the 60s, in, especially in the United States, but also in Europe, European countries. And um, and she was very, very uh, active in uh, not only in, uh, in academia, uh, in academia, so in publishing. She was also very active in um, writing columns, uh, uh, articles in newspapers in order to explain what was going on and uh, explain the fact that uh, uh, especially the, the division of labor uh, within household was a form of subjection of women. Um, she passed away in uh, 10 years ago. Uh, she was one of the founders of feminist economics uh, and the, also the, the International Association of Feminist Economics and the Shink Association. Uh, she was a mathematician uh, and an economist, uh, PhD, Harvard, Harvard PhD. And uh, she was one of the most uh, Fear, the fiercest uh, adversary uh, of Gary Becker. She wrote a, a lot uh, in order to, you know, discuss with uh, with uh, Becker and against the, the traditional approach of the mainstream economics uh, regarding gender issues. Oh, I wish we had more time. Uh, I have learned so much and I'm sure my listeners have as well. So thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you for having me. I have one more question Absolutely. for you. Uh, yes. What is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? Yeah, I I mentioned before that when I was a student, when I was much younger, uh, I thought that uh, individual freedom was enough. We we were lucky enough to live in, in, a, in, a free, in a free country, in a democratic and free country, and there was no need to, to fight 
for equality uh, among genders. Now it's different. I think that we have to uh, at least to talk about gender inequality and discrimination and uh, social pressure and gender stereotypes and so forth. So I, I st I'm still a, a, a believer of individual freedom, uh, but I really think that we have somehow to organize an agenda in order to promote not just equality, but also freedom. Once again, I'd like to thank my guests for their time and insight. I'd also like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. It means a lot. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at greatantidote at libertyfund.org. Thank you.